Age of Wonders 4 has a ton of generic factions for you to choose from, but half the fun of the game is creating your own realm, and the other half is creating your own faction. And those factions can then ascend into your pantheon, allowing you to play your own games with other new factions and seeing your own custom factions populate the map for you. It's a really amazing system. But you're probably jumping into the game and trying to make your own faction and wondering what some of these abilities mean. How do body traits and mind traits really work? What tomes are really amazing for what I want to do, what society traits, which culture, all that stuff. In this video today, we're going to answer that and kind of guide you through this process. You can navigate to any part of the video that interests you the most using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. One thing I do want to say though, before we get started, make whatever faction you want. Do not min-max this process. Enjoy it. Create your favorite elf faction from whatever lore you want to make. Make your favorite orc or human, whatever it is, really go to town on it. I just want to make that clear up front. I'm going to talk about some traits and explain to you how maybe some things are better early or late game or what their real relevance is because you probably don't have any concept of that without a couple hours into the game. So I'm just going to help out with that. Don't use this as a, well, he said, I can't use that. I don't, I'm not saying that. Have fun, make the crazy faction you've always wanted. But other than that, if you've not yet picked up Age of Wonders 4, you can use my Nexus store link in the description and pinned comment. You'll get a Steam key directly from Paradox, and it is a great way to support me as well as my mini Australian Shepherd's pup, uh, puppy addiction to what are those called? Toys. He eats so many of those damn things. But also, check me out on Twitch here where I will be streaming Age of Wonders 4 as well as the new CK3 DLC coming up here in about a couple weeks. But let's get started here on the faction creation guide for Age of Wonders 4. Jumping into the first portion of the creation is race or physical form. And really, you can go crazy here, right? You can have any physical form and then any combination of body and mind traits. You're not limited in any way, shape, or form. So make whatever you want. I'm just going to click human because it's generic. And then the first thing you want to take a look at here are our body traits. Now, body traits... Um, have a lot of different things that are going to help you out with combat mainly both of them really help you out with combat but uh, body is more of a flat bonus towards very specific things so the start off here we have bulwark and i think of the defensive body traits it's the best one because it grants two defense and two resistance when you're in defense mode I, and i find that i put myself into defense mode probably 60 70 percent of the time whenever i jump into combat and i think it's a pretty solid one from a defensive standpoint next up here is fast recuperation which is one of my favorite body traits because it regenerates an additional five hit points per world map turn now your units on average like just just a standard unit <clears throat> without any consideration of unit enhancements will recover five hit points outside of your domain and 25 hit points within your domain with fast recuperation you're doubling your outside domain from 5 to 10 and you're bringing your inside domain from 25 to 30 and i find that the majority of tier 1 2 units have less than 60 health so you can recover full uh, health on a lot of your main fighting units in two turns with faster recuperation or in oftentimes like i think a support has like 35 health that's pretty much a full health recovery in one turn. So it's a very nice ability that I think might seem underwhelming, but it allows you to kind of keep your army rolling a lot in the early and middle portions of the game. Hardy here is a flat uh, hit points increase, which is just a, a, a perfectly fine one. In fact, actually, I think as far as defensive things go, it's because it's damage mitigation, right? By having more hit points, it's a, it's a pretty good one. Keen sighted is accuracy on physical uh, ranged and magic attacks. So. If you plan on, it's, I'm sorry, it's physical range, not physical, comma, range, comma, magic attacks. It's physical range attacks. Um, if you decide to do a faction that is based a lot off of ranged units and magic units, this is actually very good. Because if you have any infantry in the way, it blocks your line of sight. And that oftentimes puts your accuracy rating at about 50-60%. So this boosts it up to about 70-80% in those situations, makes it a lot easier to get your range shots off if you're going heavy into range. So I definitely would choose that if you were. Quick Reflexes is a nice one if you're going heavy into infantry and shock troops and any kind of uh, polearm guys because this gives you a 30% harder to hit by range damage or range attack. So it's basically the opposite of Keen Sighted but for your enemy, right? So they, they are, are negated in their ability to hit you. It's a great way to get downfield without taking as much damage because you're just mitigating some of that range damage you would take otherwise. It's a very, very solid one. 
Resilient and Resistant are two that I actually don't like very much. Um, I find that there are so many ways to mitigate status um, effects on you or mitigate a lot of damage that's coming your way with unit enhancements across these two stats that is added from unit enhancements that I, I find that the body trait doesn't give me the bonus. It's better in the latter portion of the game, but by that point I'm so jammed up with unit enhancements that where this would give me benefit in the early game, I never really take advantage of it. So I, I always kind of skip these two. Same thing here with Resolute, which negative status effects last minus one turn. You don't deal with that as much in my personal experience. And again, there's a lot of ways to mitigate it through either shutting off those negative statuses from unit enhancements you have or from spells. So again, I skip this one. Strong is nice because it gives you melee and physical range attacks dealing an additional 10% damage, but this increases the physical damage of melee and range units. So if you use a unit enhancement that changes damage or adds damage of a specific elemental type, strong will not increase that unless it did physical damage increase. So for example, if I had a weapon that did 40 uh, fire damage, well, I wouldn't do 44 fire damage if I have strong. I would do 40 fire damage and 4 physical damage. So just keep that in mind with strong. I find it to be really good in the early game. It does taper off towards the mid to late game, but most things do both physical plus an elemental damage unless it's a pure magic ability. Tough here just increases your defense by 2. I personally just go with Bulwark or Hardy. Um, and then you've got your 4 mounts. Now this will replace the mounts that your faction uses. Take for example Nightmare mounts, which look sick. So now, rather than riding horses, everyone rides nightmares, yourself included. Now, again, from a min-max perspective, go with whatever you think is coolest. The nightmare mounts aren't that amazing. Intimidating Aura is good if you are really trying to rely on things that reduce the morale of things. And you can definitely build that way. So, if you want to go that route, definitely the nightmare mount's going to be amazing. But all of these are going to give you 10 more hit points too, which is kind of nice. Um, it also, note, does not affect non-mounted units, so all of your mounted units get more hit points. If you want to go heavy into cav, doing these is pretty cool. The spider mount gets this web ability, which is actually pretty cool. It immobilizes things, base 60% chance of inflicting immobilized for one turn. And it deals damage in a one damage in a one hex radius, so it's actually got a pretty good little splash effect there. So a pretty nice one there. The unicorn mount is sick because it can phase. So it can move from one target to the next and just completely jump. It's got a range of three here, you can see. So you can jump all the way and it costs zero action points to do. So you can phase and then move. That is what makes this particularly cool. So it allows you to really clear a lot of distance quickly with the unicorn. And lastly, the wolf mount is in my opinion, the strongest, because it's sick. So a powerful boost for your mounted units, but it has no effect on your other units, of course. Gains the Pack Hunter passive. Melee attacks deal 20% damage per friendly adjacent unit with Pack Hunter. There are unit enhancements in the nature tree to give Pack Hunter to everyone. So you can get, you can get real spicy with this, because even though Pack Hunter applies to your uh, mounted units, this also applies if you have a unit enhancement to your infantry units. So you can stack these bonuses to get out of control. And we'll talk about mind traits and how you can stack that with Pack Hunter. But also you get Enfeebling Growl, which deals damage and applies one state of weakened, which reduces damage by 10% and stacks up to five times. Um, this is really nice too if you're going with something like the Dark Culture, which has Cull the Weak, where you do additional damage to weakened units and also regenerate health. So this can be a really cool and easy way to get a ton of weakened out onto things. So a really cool thing nonetheless, just wanted to show it off too, and your, your character starts with a white wolf, which is even cooler. So our next thing is the Mind Trait. And Mind Traits are a little bit different. These are typically kind of like not directly uh, combat stats, but do still help in combat in some way or maybe post-combat. Adaptable here is experience gain, always great. I mean, it's kind of a flat one, no, no need to explain that. Arcane focus increases magic attacks, deal additional 15% damage. So if you really want to go heavy into magic, you can really focus on this. Cold-blooded is morale loss from all sources. This is again, trying to stack a lot of morale penalties. I don't like this as much, but, um, 
this is for your units, right? So your 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 units are losing less morale. I find that I don't necessarily have morale issues as much, but you can stack morale issues for your opponent and they usually give you morale bonuses if you go that route. Defensive tactics is a really cool one that goes kind of like overwhelm tactics, but defensive tactics gives you one defense and resistance when standing next to a friendly unit with defensive tactics. This does not stack. It's very fun to have like a, a moving dwarf wall that all gets defensive tactics with one another on top of maybe bulwark which further increases their stuff if they go into defensive mode if they're already a shield unit you can use defensive tactics to really explode a lot of mechanics which i really like so if you want to go for a slower more defensive play definitely pick this up elusive here is going to give you six defense and resistance against retaliation and opportunity attacks so i like elusive a lot but I'd rather choose Ferocious, which is the opposite, where you're dealing more damage whenever you do a retaliation and opportunity attacks. I think mind traits, if, if it's like my default mind trait. Ferocious is very strong because you will be doing a retaliation attack almost all the time, especially in the early game, and opportunity attacks are anytime anyone moves out of combat with you, right? Like attacks of opportunity like we get in almost every other RPG, it's the same thing here. And dealing 40% more damage to that is very, very, very punishing. Fast initiative is gonna give you first turn of combat, you can move up to six hexes, it's kind of like a, a pre-placement. Um, it's okay, it, unless you're trying to play a very fast and aggressive play style, I would skip out on it because I find that there's so many other mind traits that I'd like a lot more, like any of the, d d the tactics ones are ferocious. Speaking of, Overwhelm tactics here. So, defensive tactics gave us defensive bonuses. Overwhelm gives us 20% crit hit chance when standing next to a friendly unit with Overwhelm tactics. This does not stack. So you could use Overwhelm tactics, use the wolf mount, and just really go to town with putting things next to each other to boost up their attack damage. Um, you can use Overwhelm tactics plus Ratkin to effectively create the Skaven from Warhammer and a bunch of other things that we'll go into. Sneaky here gives you 25% damage on flanking attacks, which is actually quite common. So if you do have a lot of fast moving target or uh, uh, units that you want to get around things, Sneaky is not a bad idea. Tenacious is going to give you damage penalties from casualties or halved. So this is actually very nice. So you have a unit that is represented on the battlefield by little tiny models, right? And every time you hit certain breakpoints or damage thresholds, you lose less of those models. So when you lose those models, you do more damage. That damage penalty now is halved whenever you take casualties. As I, it'll explain here, this is whenever a unit sustains damage, members of this unit are lost. So basically you do more damage for a longer period of time than you would anyone else who does not have this. It's actually a pretty, pretty good one. Then you've got your, ad your adaptations for Arctic, desert, underground, and then water. So the nicest thing about these is that you get the ability to build farms on these uh, respective locations, Arctic, desert, and water. So that's cool. And also, <clears throat> also it's easier to move across those respective uh, terrain types. Again, cool, but very situational. Underground adaptation though, gives you all the same benefits as the other two, building it on cavern floors, but you also get excavation from the general empire skill line. So it's worth noting, I, I personally don't like the adaptations because I feel like it kind of forces my uh, faction to a very specific play style, and that's just not the way I play. But if you have that in mind for your faction, then by all means, do it. Moving on to your culture, we have your different cultures. Feudal High, Barbarian, Industrious, Dark, and Mystic. So when you're going through this, if you want an idea of what all these units do, go ahead and go back, go back what again, press this I button for the encyclopedia, press this little helmet, for all of the actual cultural units, and then go ahead and select the ones that you wanna see. I don't wanna jump through every single one of those things because I do want this to be a bit of a discovery for you. I will kind of generally outline what the units are like or what they specialize in, but again, I think it's very fun to discover portions of the game and not have all the game ruined for you by some block-headed YouTuber like myself. <laughs> so to start off here, you have the feudal. 
culture. And this has a special, uh, all of the cultures have the same building line, but then they also get a special building line unique to their culture. So there's basically there's generic buildings and then there are cultural buildings. So the cultural buildings for feudal are going to be ones with food income, allowing them to expand very quickly. They also get a special ability called Stand Together, which is going to increase that damage by 20%. Again, this is going to go really well with your wolf mount or your overwhelm tactics. It's a really, really cool ability. And then they get feudal lords. So basically, you've got these different um, lord types, and they are skills that a hero can choose. And crops, knowledge, magic, and production are all special ones that give them bonuses towards a specific uh, resource income or Lord of War, which gives five hit points and 25% movement after you win a battle triggering only once. So it's a pretty cool way to kind of flavor your Lords across the map and maybe make them better governors in certain locations and what have you. So there's that. As far as the units go for feudal, you have very weak tier one units with the peasants and you have your scout here as well, but then it progresses upwards towards your knight, which obviously is going to be filled with a lot of charging. You've got your bannerman as your support unit, the sword and shield guy which is really good he's got a really heavy shield so it negates it gives him more defense and negates flanking and the spells here are generally geared towards support that's the only and i guess this guy's the only spell caster there are special units that you can research and upgrade or special units you can get from tomes i'm not going to go into those but it's just kind of worth talking about how the general playstyle of these guys are they're very well rounded weak low morale low armor low health Unit uh, tier one units up to strong cav at the top end. Um, also, too, you have your affinities. Now, these affinities, some will oppose one another. Like, for example, order opposes chaos and vice versa. But that's only for external purposes. So you can go with a feudal faction and go heavy into chaos tomes if you want. You don't need to feel restricted in that regard. But it is worth noting that you're not going to be as fun to deal with when it comes to maybe a chaos affinity empire or faction on the map next up is high and high is pretty awesome here so structures have city stability and knowledge income so it allows you to really push through your uh, research tree a lot quicker units are strengthened with awakened which gives four spirit damage on base attacks and this is kind of sells the short but dormant traits are amazing they're basically additional traits that all the units that of the high culture have which give them additional abilities take for example seeking missiles so the Sun Priest, the Scout, and I think, I don't remember the, the Protoss guy right here. <laughs> I don't remember what, what they're called. Um, I think it's like a Diviner or something like that. And also your Archer. When you awaken them, Seeking Missiles increases their range by 1 and 20% additional accuracy. It's super sick. Uh, the Shield guys get more defense. These guys get more damage. It's really, really cool. And it's an ability that you can easily do through spells or the Sun Priest himself, this guy over here can cast a spell to awaken things it's really fun these guys though have a lot of really good mid-range stay ability with a lot of punching power from spells with a lot of spirit damage and the ability to buff things up with both of your casters that's kind of their stick is more support less offensive magic is what i would say when it comes to their units themselves not the tomes or anything like that barbarians oh did i no no i'm sorry I, I didn't cover the rest of this uh you also get alignment which is fun because you get 10 uh, good alignment but you have this other cool thing called the alignment agenda this is probably the coolest thing about the uh the high culture so you get three different options you can go pure good which gives stability in all cities neutral which gives food and production per city stability level above neutral in all cities and then pure evil where the units start in awakened state so just because you're choosing the high culture doesn't mean you have to be good aligned. You can go hard on the paint on evil with them, which I think is really sick. You can choose high and then go with, um, I'm sorry, my, my allergies are killing me today. You can go with high and then go with like scions of evil and go into pure evil and make it so they all start awakened. Otherwise, you have to awaken things using skills from your hero, spells from your, your uh, units, or spells from your actual tomes. It's pretty, pretty fun. Barbarians here are about fast attack and expansion with structures that gear towards food and draft income. You're going to have a lot of expansion and a lot of soldiers to jump into. Melee units have Primal Strike here, which is a first melee attack that hits in battle, deals an additional eight blight damage. That's kind of their thing. They do a lot of blight damage. And they get Ritual of Alacrity here. So pretty much this is something that you can cast on outposts and cities. And when you do, friendly units on the center of the outpost or city will restore 50% hit points and 100% 
movement points and remove exhausted from um, Force March here. So this is all about fast movement, fast attack, constantly being on the move, constantly adding pressure to your enemy. Your defense is kind of this it's it's not like it's not weak like this is like your tier one unit right here and he has just the same amount of un, uh, defense as this guy right here so don't think that they have like really low defense they do a lot of damage and your top tier unit is this dude right there the berserker which gets a cool berserk ability your shaman has abilities that are doing poison damage or boosting the movement of your ability of your of your units and you don't get any cavalry if you've noticed you have this character which is a skirmisher which does both ranged and melee damage so you do have a different setup now. I mean, High doesn't have any cavalry either, but it's just to kind of illustrate that each one of these cultures has a different unit setup. Into Industrious now, you're getting structures with production income. Uh, through bolstering, units get sturdier, so you get either bolstered defense or bolstered resistance. So when they take melee or physical damage, they get one defense, stacks five times. So if you get hit four times in combat, you get four defense, which is pretty cool. And each successive hit, you're getting more and more defense. So you're mitigating more and more of that damage. And the same thing here is for magic, you get bolster resistance, which increases that resistance. Um, lastly, they get scout prospecting, which basically if you come across a cliff, mountain, or stalagmite, then your scout unit can prospect the province for production or gold reward. One thing to, to mention here is that, that the scout for the Industrious is different and that they can do those abilities. And every scout is a little different per faction. The Barbarian one, for example, can actually make outposts, which is really sick. Industrious Caster over here also has the ability to bolster defense and bolster resistances, but you can see there's no cavalry in this force. You're dealing with a lot of sword and board, slow moving, defensive juggernauts. This is your tier three unit in the back there, and he is just going to hold that line. He can also bolster people's defense around him. He is a tank of tanks. Moving into dark, we have probably one of my favorite factions here. There we go. Uh, so cities can negate city stability income penalties. They get a building around, I think, the second or third uh, city tier, where uh, it's the third, it's the third city tier, where they just completely negate city stability. Like, oh, you have like negative city stability? They don't care. It's not going to reduce their income, which is awesome. Unique city structures granting knowledge and extra income from prisons and crypts. So again, a lot of uh, stuff that's going to push you through your uh, research tree quicker. And units specialize in inflicting negative status effects and exploiting them with Call the Weak. So a lot of your units, mainly your range units, have the ability to put weakened onto things, which reduces their damage, remember, right? Well, Call the Weak means that I now deal 20% damage to that unit with weakened, and I regenerate three or so hit points, whatever. I, I think regeneration is a certain percentage. Oh, unit heals six hit points at the end of its turn in battle but it stacks, so you can get up to 30 hit points, which is really great. Uh, if you've never played, temporary hit points leave after the combat ends. So it's not a full replenishment. You have to replenish on the, on the actual campaign map once you've lost it in the combat map. But it's a really fun faction. I, I really, really enjoy it because you're stacking all these abilities to weaken things with your three range units. This is a caster back there. And this caster also has the ability to do like a long range bomb and reduce their... Uh, they can weaken them and reduce their resistances as well. So it's just it's such a fun cool uh, uh, Faction also you get a, a tier 1 shock troop, which is different than the other ones We've talked about so you get a lot of aggression at the early game and tier 3 is your uh, knight right there Dark Knight the antithesis to your feudal um, so Lastly, we have Mystics, which are also very cool. Structures with income from mana, or mana income. Units have attunement, star blades, making them stronger when a spell is cast in battle. So when a, a spell is cast, this unit's base attack randomly gains one fire, lightning, or frost damage for three turns and stacks up to three times. And you have a lot of ways to constantly cast in combat too. So this allows you to get a lot of spells off to get all three of the damage bonuses here from these star blades. And they themselves do, I think that's an incorrect grammar or whatever. They do a lot of different elemental damage types, which is pretty fun. Oh, where is it? Astral Echoes here is your special pickup, only visible to and collectible by rulers of mystic culture. Astral Echoes grant knowledge and mana on pickup. The city structure, Altar of the All Seers, grants bonuses income depending on the amount of Astral Echoes, which is really cool. Kind of adds a whole different play style to the, uh, the culture that is different than the other ones, of course, right? This is your scout right here, which is pretty cool. This guy can pass through. He's ethereal, just 
goes right through them. And this is your tier three character right there. So you have a very different setup here with Mystic than you do the all the other ones. And again, if you want to jump into what each one of these units does before you do that, you can go back, go to the encyclopedia, go to the cultural units and look at each one. But again, I wanted to kind of let you discover that. With Mystic, you're getting a lot of offensive magic. Everything in this army, for the exception of these guys with their spears, can cast a spell. Um, these guys have like an AoE like uh, stun. These three have, well, these four actually, all have some sort of AoE frost or lightning or fire damage. It's a really, really fun, cool culture as well. For our section on society traits, what I want to talk about here is, is mainly like what some of these things actually are. Not like, oh, this one's going to be the best. Again, that's kind of been the shtick of this whole video, but it's just me kind of outlining what this means for you. So for Chosen Uniters, this is going to give you income from vassals, which is really nice. So that makes it so that at the top end, you're actually going to make 70% more income from vassals than you would someone else that doesn't have this trait. Your alignment's 10. Shield units and polearm units have plus one rank to start off with. Um, I think the total rank is either five, six, or seven. I can't remember. It's a Legend is the last one, or Champion's the last one, but those ranks just give you additional things like um, more hit points, more defense, whatever it is. Starts with an extra unit, extra shield or polearm unit, and then a diplomatic focus. So one thing I want you to think about with these starting bonuses and the shield and uh, polearm units that you get, think about also the culture that you are, right? Like, for example, you know, you have really strong shield units with Industrious. With Feudal, you don't really have very strong polearm units. So just kind of keep those things in mind when you are selecting those things, if that's something you care about. The extra unit you get might not be that amazing depending upon which um, culture you've set yourself up with. Also, they get a starting bonus of Diplomatic Focus. Now that is a general empire skill. It means you get one more Whispering Stone. So you can have more vassals out the gate and more vassals probably total than anyone else if you go about the same kind of general routes. But it then shuts off all of your uh, extremely negative uh, society traits, such as Ritual Cannibals, Ruthless Raiders, and Scions of Evil. Um, Devotees of Good here. And now, also keep in mind, this is going to choose, this is going to increase your affinity. And affinity also will increase how much you make in the Empire Tree towards the respective branch of that um, set of affinity, which you'll understand once you get into the game. Devotees of Good is basically your Paladins. This is going to help out with city stability and your Empire gains 5 Imperium per level of good alignment. That's really nice because it allows you to take advantage of your Empire Tree more. You can push Allegiance up with your Vassals faster. Or you can actually just, in, um, what's it called? Not recruit population. Encourage population or, or get population. It basically, it, it helps increase your province expansion quicker if you use Imperium on it. 10 alignment, support units and polearm units have one rank and start with an extra support and or polearm or, or polearm unit and shuts off these society traits. Imperialist is a pretty cool one here. Imper there we go. <laughs> Imperialist is a pretty cool one here because the throne cities and cities that share a border with the throne city gain 20 stability and 20 gold income. So this allows you to kind of make one big spanning sprawling empire, which you'll probably just do natively in your gameplay. But this makes you actually get a bonus for doing that. And your capital city gets one extra population out the gate. That's not an amazing starting bonus. Um, just because you're going to get that population so fast and your population caps for a city at 25. This doesn't increase that to 26. You don't get one extra province. It just means you start with a province faster, which then can cause a landslide of getting uh, your, pro your production or your food up quicker. But... It's not that huge of a starting bonus, just to kind of illustrate that. The effect is the best part. Prolific Swarmers is if you want to create this Skaven from Warhammer. Cities require 10% less food for gaining a new population, and Tier 1 units have plus 1 rank. All of them. It's sick. And also you can get a tone that makes your Tier 1 units are even better, and all sorts of fun stuff. Non-magic uh, origin units require 20% less upkeep as well, and start with one extra Tier 1 unit. It's just really jumping in. It's even There's even rats, man. Ritual Cannibals turns you into vampires. Units gain the Corpse Eating ability, which is pretty cool. It spends zero points, so you use it before you do anything in your combat turn, and you get 15 temporary hit points. It's pretty sweet. And it only has a one-turn cooldown, so it's pretty, pretty cool. 
minus 10 to alignment. The nearest city owned gains three mana and three food per tier of non-magic origin units killed or lost after successful combat. So losing units actually gives you income or killing units gives you income. Ritual Raiders here, uh, Ruthless ra <laughs> ruthless Raiders. The nearest city owned gains three gold and three draft per tier of unit killed after successful combat. Per unit killed, not unit lost as well. So keep that in mind. Also, you get two random hero items, which is a really cool way to just get a lot of bonuses uh, for your hero at the gate. Those can include mounts, so you can have a bunch of mount options for your hero too. Ancient Wise Ones, when a tome is unlocked, a random skill from that tome costs 60% less knowledge. This is just a way to push through your tome system faster, but do be mindful of this one, because if you're not kind of... If you don't really have a really good idea of what the tome system, how it really works, what you'll end up doing is pushing through a bunch of meager tome uh, skills, or I guess it's just skills, I suppose, and push into higher tiers and, and kind of realize, oh man, I kind of screwed my progression up. So we'll talk about that in a second in tomes. So just be mindful of it. One random research skill is already unlocked too, which is kind of nice. Gifted, it's a random research skill from the pool of the tome you select. Gifted Casters is 10 both combat and world map casting points. If you've not played the game yet, the way that that works is you have com you have casting points you use on the combat map and ones you use on the map, the world map, and there's two different pools on top of mana. You use both, both respective uh, either combat or world map casting points and mana to cast a spell. Combat spells cost 20% less mana to cast as well and start with one extra combat spell unlocked. And I'll talk about that in the tome section because uh, the tomes have skills as God, as well as combat spells. And those combat spells are buffs on all these ones right here. <laughs> mana channelers, summoning spells, did I get all that? Yes. Uh, mana channelers, summoning spells cost 50% less mana to cast and magic origin, origin units have plus one rank. Start with an extra magic origin unit. Mana Channelers is really cool to like double up with maybe you're doing like a necromancy playthrough or you're doing any of like the summoning playthroughs. Mana Channelers is a really, really cool one that allows you to get a lot of summoning spells onto the field very quickly. Adept Settlers. Oh, also keep in mind though, some of these are shutting off. Incompatible society traits, imperialists. So if I choose this, I cannot then choose imperialists. So just keep those things in mind too. <clears throat> Adept Settlers, plus one city cap. Nice, because that your city cap, uh, there is a set city cap in the game, <clears throat> and I believe it's like five. Add up settlers brings you to six, or whatever the plus one of that total cap is. So it's a nice way to increase that. Uh, you can increase that through your general things as well. Founding cities cost 25% less Imperium, which is lovely, meaning that every time you find city ruins and you want to found a city out of that, it costs, I think, generically 300 Imperium. That's going to bring that down by 25%. Newly found cities also gain one pop. So as soon as you found them, they jump into a second province, um, which is actually a really nice bit of combo so that you can get some quick claims out quickly so that you can solidify that location so your enemy can't push against you and prevent you from expanding with your provinces because if you've got claims around you, it causes grievances. I covered that in my tips video. Guess what? It's still in the upper right-hand corner. Starting bonus, capital city starts with plus one pop. So what I like about Adept Settlers over Imperialists starting bonus is that the effects of adept settlers are a little bit more apparent i think you can say imperialists you have to build towards placing your things together adept settlers is you you take advantage of city ruins a lot better and you can sack a city and destroy it into ruins and then use all these bonuses to to turn it back into a city and take advantage of all the things you get as a as adept settlers so Keep those things in mind if you want to go with this over order. Experienced seafarers, fisheries, yield two gold, two food, and two draft, which is actually very nice if you have a map that has any actual water on it. If you don't, this is wasted. Naval units cost 25% resources to recruit and maintain, and naval units have to rank. Also, you start with basic seafaring, which means your units can disembark, or I'm sorry, can embark and use vessels to cross the water, and for flying and floating units to travel over water. So... Without this, you cannot go over water, even with flying and floating units, which is important to note. Fabled Hunter, and you'll be able to, this is the very first thing that you can actually do in your general line, so if you don't choose it here, you can still do it, don't worry about it. Fabled Hunters here gain 100% resources from clearing an infestation, which you'll do a lot. Ancient Wonders, which you'll do a lot, or a resource node. 
clearing it. There's usually something on a resource node and you kill it, clear it, and you get a little bit of uh, resources. And 100% resources, not items or anything else that you get. It's still a very good one. I just want to make the distinction here because you might look at that and go, oh, cha-ching. It's still really good. Still really good. I just want to, again, draw the delineation. Range units and skirmisher units have plus one rank. Again, look at the culture you're going with. Skirmisher units on this might not be amazing for you if you're the barbarians, but it might be great because they have good they have good range units. So keep in mind your range units are going to benefit from this um, if you're playing to. I think battle mages still count as range units. Uh, no, they're not. That, that symbol is the unit. So archers are your range units. Your uh, uh, scouts are range units. So your mages are not. And it, support and battle mage units are not range units. Uh, but they'll also get plus one rank, and you start with one extra range unit. So if you're trying to hinge yourself on range units from your uh, form selection and body traits, this is what you're going to choose. Great builders here. Quarries yield to gold. Special province improvements cost minus 50% production, which is nice. And capital city starts with a workshop, which increases draft and production, and stone walls. All real great. Real, real strong capabilities if you're building a very defensive, slow-moving, very high playthrough. Because gold production and draft are going to allow you to make more units, more buildings, and, well, gold helps with everything. <laughs> Runesmiths here. Unit in unit enchantment research costs minus 30% knowledge to unlock. So every single tome has unit enchantments, and this is going to reduce that knowledge by 30% to get those research, which is very nice. And then actually um, casting them causes an upkeep on you, an actual per turn mana and or gold and or souls whatever it is upkeep this reduces that by 30 percent and then shield and polearm units get one rank and you start with an extra shield or polearm unit i think the game defaults to whatever one is a higher rank i'm not sure to be honest wonder architects is a really cool one that i really enjoy stop it there we go ancient wonders do not require population in order to be annexed to a city so what that means is you want to annex um Ancient Wonders, because they give you a ton of bonuses. A ton of bonuses. And you place an outpost next to them and annex them, or you just kind of expand your provinces to annex them. Or if you have Wonder Architects, you just get your domain next to them, and they become immediately annexed. It saves you population on what you would otherwise spend that would detract from your population pool. It's a very good one. And then cities gain 20% production per annex Ancient Wonders, which oftentimes give you production anyway. And you start with one nearby Ancient Wonder cleared. So you can just jump into one right out the gate with uh, Wonder Architects. I do love it indeed. Powerful Evokers. Uh, Battle Mage units here. Oh, oops. Didn't mean to click it. Uh, Battle Mage units and Support units have one rank. Battle Mage units and Support units provide five combat casting points at the start of the combat. And you start with an extra one. So if you want to go hard in the paint on ca casting a lot of combat spells and use a lot of battle mage and support units, like if you're playing the Mystics, Powerful Evokers is very good. Scions of Evil here. Cities gain 10 draft and your empire gains 5 Imperium per level of evil alignment. So the, the, the harder on the paint on evil you go, the more you get to increase the amount of units you produce. And you can jump through Imperium, which we talked about before, right? That is your allegiance gain. That is your uh, empire development tree. That's increasing your population, whatever it is. And then units are recruited with one rank when you are at the maximum evil uh, alignment. And shock units and shield units have one rank as well, and you start with an extra one. So if you're playing as um, dark, you'll start with an extra shock unit. Shadow Walkers is our last one here. Cities and provinces have two vision range. Scouts have universal camouflage, which is pretty sick. means that they can not be seen on the map unless you're right next to them. Outposts start with the Watchtower upgrade, meaning they have increased uh, range, viewing range, uh, uh, what's this thing, a vision range. <laughs> and then the Wayfinder enchantment, which is a generic enchantment that everyone gets access to, they start with it, and it's awesome, you, and it gets no upkeep too. So it's immediately on board, so they all of your scouts move at 48 speed rather than 32, 36, so they get very fast movement. And you start with an extra scout, which I'd recommend you do no matter what, make an extra scout. So Shadow Walkers is a really, really cool one. So you really can't go wrong with whatever society traits you wanted to go with. I just wanted to give you an idea of how these actually play into the game rather than just say, hey, choose two, have at it, or these two are the best. Just, again, build how you want. Okay, on to the tomes. Now, I'm not going to go through every single tome. They give you a real good 
summary of what they are right here, I'm just gonna kind of highlight some stuff to go over. So every single tome, even after this point in the game, will always have an initial bonus. It'll award you some points of affinity. It'll give you some form of something. Like this is a building in this specific instance that is a special province improvement that it unlocks with the Tome of Zeal. And you'll get some sort of uh, <coughs> hero skill. So this is Condemned. Target enemy units become Condemned. This is something that you would naturally get as part of the Tome itself for your units, but now your hero can take advantage of it. Also, you'll get bonuses to your casting pools. So as we push through these, you can see, okay, this gives me a special improvement for Abby. This gives me Mending Touch as a uh, adept hero skill or uh, a support adept hero skill. So just to kind of illustrate this, all of these are going to have this. And after this point in the game, you're going to get this no matter what. Now, the Tomb of Souls, for example, here has a tome passive after winning battle gain souls. That souls, those souls are used as a currency to summon things like the Bone Golem here requires souls um, and you fuse two skeleton units together. You have a bunch of stuff here. But again, for the most part, a lot of this is very self-explanatory. It's illustrated right here, and you have your individual spells that you're going to hover over. Now, you've got a bunch of different types of spells. You've got summon spells. You've got your unit enchantments, which are very important to note because they cost uh, an, they cost an amount to cast. Then there is an, a um, upkeep for having it. And every time you create something that applies to this unit. So for example, this is Staves of Warding, makes support abilities of enchanted units gain plus two bolstered resistance uh, to affected units. So this is not gonna apply to my polearm units, my sword and board guys, my shock units. It's gonna apply to my support guys. So if I make more support units, then I will pay more upkeep because this is active. And you can see the borders of these, they kind of give you a rough indication of what the spell does. Like this is a summon, so that's the, that's the kind of look of a summon. This is an enchantment, so it's this kind of square with these little uh, pointed uh, triangles here. This is a buff spell. This is a buff spell. You see how these have both the same border? And then this is a minor race transformation. There are two types of transformations, minor and major. Minor are not permanent. You can turn them on and off. They cost an upkeep. Major are permanent changes to your race. And they will do things like give them demon wings or give them angel wings and all sorts of cool stuff. You'll get them in the tier four tomes as you progress through the game. But remember, tomes are pretty much how you're gonna generate affinity. And that affinity is gonna dictate what is accessible to you in the empire tree. My advice to you is kind of approach this like Magic the Gathering. Choose two colors and maybe splash a third. That's kind of the, the, the best way to approach it. Kind of create a theme for yourself, you know? Like, I made vampire kin, and the way I did that was going dark culture, dark society traits, and tome of souls. I wanted these necromancer vampire characters, so that's what I did. Or you can go skaven, and you can kind of go, uh, the tome of beasts? I think it's tome of beasts. Uh, no, 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 it's, yeah, tome of the horde. And you can do, like, all from the tier one units become one strengthened. There's another one here that spawn kin increase the number of units from formations and 20% damage, incompatible super growth, hound master. Like there's all these cool goddamn things you can do. And these tomes completely change the gameplay or game style or attack damage, whatever it is, or the 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 gameplay you have in mind. Like enchantment, like each one of these, take a look at the borders. That's three abilities. That are unit enchantments, one, two, and three. So just kind of keep those things in mind here because you can have a lot of fun with changing the way the game actually plays using these respective tomes. And especially as you progress up to the other tomes, where I, you can't look at it in this menu here, but they're gonna change the damage you do or whatever it is. So just kind of look through these, take your time, read a lot of them. They're really cool. And they're things that I didn't think would be as cool. I'm like, ah, Tome of Roots, I don't give a crap about this. Oh, Poison Blade? That kind of goes really well with my Barbarian I'm playing. Poison Arrows? That's sick. What's Vine Prison do? Oh, a Combat Summon Spell? What's Healing? Oh, this heals? That's pretty sick. And Regeneration 2? You know, that gives me 6 hit points per turn, or uh, per click. That's 2. That's 12 hit points. That's really sick. Oh, and Twine Thrall? Which summons onto the campaign map, by the way. So you summon them, you put them on the campaign map, and you put them into an army. So that's important to note. So, have at it. This is very much dealer's choice. 
choose the ones that are going to fit the theme of what you're creating and try to really like look at this this is this is <laughs> this is a chaotic amount of affinity so i would probably go with something from tome of faith zeal roots or beasts to stack into two or three two colors splashing a third it's really the best way to get the most out of your empire tree because if you go too heavy into a bunch of different colors then you won't be able to take advantage of the high affinity scores you need for dialogues and quests and stuff like that. I'll just choose this and we'll move on. So now for our origin, we're choosing either our champion or a wizard king. So the champion, you can see all cities have gold income and uh, gold income and 20 stability increased. All non-hero units gain more experience and starts with 100 relation with free cities. The, uh, <clears throat> what's it called? The, the story behind this is you are a champion rising up from the ranks to oppose the wizard kings who are tyrants that have come from the astral sea to oppress people or not even oppress more or less just control whatever the hell they want the wizard kings are all about mana and casting and they have an over channel ability that allows them to even cast more in combat but if you want to play a combat character you can still play a wizard king if you want to play a champion and be a, a, a caster you can still play a champion so don't even worry about it choose whatever you want the things that are worth noting here is that the champion can only be of the race you are currently creating, whereas the wizard king can be of any race that you are, that you want. So I can just go physical form. Look, look at that. I'm different now. I'm going to be a mole, a mole man uh, ruling over humans, whatever you want to do. It is also kind of worth pointing out, too, that your outfit, helmet, and cape options for the wizard king are different than the champion. So, like... Look at this sweet ass helmet. Or, yeah, look at my 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 space cosmos face, my astral head. So you have a bunch of different little cosmetic choices that you can choose if you're going with a wizard king over a champion, which has a little bit more terrestrial style of improvements. This is something from the Pantheon tree. So if you're looking for it, you won't be able to to go on the Pantheon tree. But you have a bunch of different options here. It's not worth this is again so dealer's choice so have at it make sure you choose your primary and secondary colors as well as your symbol and then your race can be selected however you see fit here too um you can swap out your mounts here as well so, except for you know you can't have spiders nightmares unicorns or wolves although that's a wolf so, <laughs> so take it with a grain of salt i suppose <laughs> but we'll go ahead and just press select and jump to the end here where you choose your title uh, and then you choose your first last name and your race name and you're done after that point once you're that once you're at this point You just go ahead and press onward. So hopefully this helps you out in getting a good idea of What character you want to make or what faction you want to make? I know a lot of this I've kept saying choose what you want choose what you want choose what you want But it really is the crux of this game is creating whatever the hell you want But hopefully now you have a better idea of what these units do, how these actual things apply to the game, or what society traits, how they actually overlap and what they really do. Because I think that's the biggest thing I got hung up on when I was making this the first time is what the hell do the body and mind traits actually do in the constraints of the game. And it took me like 15 hours to actually get to the point to understand how valuable some things are over the others. So take your time in here, experiment, go back a little bit and take a look at... Uh, Oops. And take a look at... The, oh, stop it. And take a look at this screen to see more about the units. I mean, if you want to go, well, you know what? What comes from the tomes? Well, go in here to the tome units and get... Oh, what's an astral serpent? Okay, cool. Well, it says I can summon up a chaplain. What's that guy? Well, there's the chaplain. All the stats. You can even press this button and look at what they look like if you give them certain enchantments. So if you really want to see what, like, aesthetically, like, how they please ye, you can do that. You can have all sorts of fun with this. <laughs> you can stack them up, too. It's... One of the coolest portions of the game so have fun enjoy yourself <clears throat> go crazy with it my vampire kin here uh, probably one of my favorite factions i've created i'm having a ton of fun with them but i made like warhammer high elves here i made i don't know these dudes paladins so just go crazy make a lot of them but they will not appear in games until you win a game with them then they ascend to actual leaders there so keep that all in mind but as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. If you have any questions, by all means, go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. I'm more than happy to help out as best I can. But have a good one and take care.